Hey, it's Diane and Key bringing you another episode of Now What? Today, we're going to continue the discussion with episode 46 special guest, Jeremy Ritt at Infinite Skills. If you like what you hear from the show and want to support what we do, share this podcast with a friend. You can find us on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and Twitter at Now What Radio. And if you are really down with this show and you're about this energy, stop what you're doing. Take two minutes to head over to nowwhatradio.com and subscribe to our mailing list so you can be first to hear what's new. And while you're there, pick up your Now What t-shirt and use promo code NOWWHAT21 for your 21% discount. Now let's get on to the show. Today we have a special guest. Why don't you introduce our special guest for today's topic? Nobody likes losing, but not everybody's willing to do the work necessary to ensure the win. Absolutely, Diane. And of course, um, I'm absolutely thrilled to introduce this next guest uh, here. And I'm so glad that he agreed to be on Uh, today. He's a great, great person, just a great man, a great brother, a great teacher. He's a leader in our communities. He's well-educated, very well-spoken. He's also uh, someone who's very well educated. He's a Morehouse man. Uh, he has his uh, master's degree. He's also a business owner and entrepreneur. I want everybody to welcome our next guest to the Now What podcast, Mr. Jeremy Ritt. Jeremy, thank you so much for being on the podcast. How you doing today, man? I'm doing great. Thank you for that that very gracious uh, introduction. Uh, you, you're way too kind uh i'm just a regular dude uh just like everybody else out here trying to trying to make it uh but um i i'm happy to be here i'm honored to be to be asked to be on the show i'm a fan of the show so it's been been cool to be able to participate m- more actively with you guys man that's what's up that's what's up jeremy so again man i appreciate you being a part of it here man i and so man i just want to come out of the gate and i just wanted to get this interview going uh here jeremy brother uh you're in an interracial marriage, right? What is the toughest part about being in an interracial marriage? Uh, the marriage itself is not tough. Uh, it's how people react to it, uh, because I was very deliberate um, in all of my dating and finding a mate. Um, and that, that search included uh, people of all ethnic backgrounds. But I think I guess the toughest part about being in an interracial uh, marriage is for someone who is community minded or I consider myself to be community minded um, and care about what happens in the black community and to black people uh, for people to question that because of who I I, I happen to be married to. And so uh, sometimes people feel like, well, you can't really be for the people if you're not married to, to your people. And I disagree with that uh, because that, that, you know, that fight for me started before I found my wife um, and race ha- really had no part in that search. And I know for some people, um, they choose to make um, race part of their, their, their search for a mate. And that's fine. That's, that's their right. It wasn't for me, but that doesn't change my, my actions as far as advocating for our people, for our rights for our respect, uh, for our our full actualization of of the rights that are supposed to be afforded to us in the Constitution. So because some people want to put a a shackle or a seal on what you can do because of who you marry, I think that's that's a problem uh, for them because it's not something that I allow uh, to impact my decision making. But I have had conversations with people who question my motivations uh, based on, on that that alone. And, you know, it's sad for them, but I've learned since middle school to love myself regardless of, of how other people feel about it. And that's just another way that I have to manifest that. Absolutely, man. Well, you know, definitely I know, um, being in our community, especially there are people who might feel a certain way because you might be married to someone outside of your race. Some people feel that you can't go as hard for, rights for so i mean which is ridiculous in my mind because we're about people right and we're about uplifting people of course um you know black and brown people face very specific or specific challenges with that being said though who you're married to who you love who you're in a relationship with has no bearing on how you can care and uh be active 
for your communities, man. So uh, I, I appreciate you sharing. And I, and I have active, healthy relationships also with, uh, with quite a few uh, black women. I'm, I, you know, i have a great relationship with my mother. So it's not as though I don't understand the power and, and the beauty of black women. It just happened to be that my wife is not white, is, is not black. And so um, I think the people who know me and, you know, those friends, as you said, I went to Morehouse. Um, I made a lot of friends in the Atlanta University Center while I was there. And and since then, the people who know me know where my, my heart lies. Um, and I, I leave it at that because most, most times it's people who don't really understand who you are and what you're about. Yep. Well said, man. Morehouse, speaking of that, man, um, that's an awesome school, great HBCU. Uh, how did you make the, the decision to attend Morehouse? Blessings. Um, more, I feel like Morehouse chose me. Uh, when I started my college search, I w- really wasn't thinking about single-sex institutions um, for um, social reasons, I guess. And there's people in my life, I, I think, that were looking out for me. And uh, I got a an application to Morehouse in a plain envelope. I uh, just had my name and address on it. Didn't have a return address. It just came to my house. And I saw the application. I obviously knew what Morehouse was, but I hadn't really done a whole lot of research into it as far as you know what it could offer me in my next stage of my education. But I, I looked at the application. It was relatively easy to fill out. Filled it out. Came back. Um, did the campus visit and my first step on campus it just felt like home when i when i hear a lot of our you know legends and and just activists they went to spelman college and that is a great source of pride for women is morehouse the equivalent but for for men or for someone who's not familiar with hbcus I am not personally familiar. I am gaining my, you know, knowledge and, and learning more about them. I am always trying to get my nephews to go to it and apply to an HBCU. I actually was first even heard about it when I read uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates' um, book. Um, I can't recommend that uh, Black and Brown people uh, go to HBCUs any any more, any higher than I than I have. I mean it absolutely helped form who I was. And when I met Kiki, he, he met me fresh off of campus at, in what I consider to be the uh, Mecca for um, black and brown women who are uh, on that college path, uh, it, which is the Atlanta University Center. Uh, Morehouse is right across the street from Spelman. And I would say that it is every much, uh, every bit the male version of of what you know about about Spelman. It is the greatest incubator of black leadership in America. Um, with respect with respect to Howard University, which also does a very, very good job of it. Uh, but Howard's by itself in, in DC, whereas in the Atlanta University Center, you have Morehouse, you have Spelman, you have Clark Atlanta, uh, you've had Morris Brown. And so all of those schools that were right there in that same spot, like it just forms so many parts of me as an adult uh, and and empowered me in, in different ways. Uh, one of the things they tell you as freshmen is that, you know, your friend group will will help determine um, your your ascension. But also, this will probably be the last time when you see this many black faces that are trying to achieve all the, some of the same things that you are, because we're going to go out and be in, in that corporate world and you might be the one. Or you might be in, in a handful, and so enjoy that camaraderie, enjoy that fellowship that you have with uh, with your people, and and draw on that power from those experiences to know that you're not alone. Because they try to tokenize you and make you feel like, well, you're just different from your people, or whatever. And like that was something that I struggled with in high school was that you know there were me and one or one or two other um, young black men in those advanced diploma courses, and they try to make it seem like oh, you're the weirdo, you're different. And, you know, some of that comes from your own people uh, sometimes, but like, you know, if that was less bothersome than, you know, that sort of tokenization that, that you get. And so when I'm immersed in a, in a sea of, you know, 
black and brown bodies. Yeah, in a sea of blackness and, and just to feel that power and know how much we can achieve in spite of all the the obstacles that are put in front of us is is just a powerful thing. And it it gives me a source of strength when in you know in years like 2020, uh, where where things are coming at you from all different directions and just having that resiliency. And you know, I built up a lot of that. But also on a social standpoint, at the AUC, I could go days if I wanted to and not see a white person. Essentially if I, you know, if I stayed on campus and so there might have been one or two white guys on campus. And so you see how it feels to be a part of the majority. And also you have the experience of what it feels to be part of a of a minority. And so that helps me treat people um, better because I've been on both sides of the, those coins. And you can't really get that without traveling um, in America. And so uh, that helped me, you know, honestly be a, a nicer, more decent person, uh, even when I'm in a situation where I might have the upper hand. Yeah, for sure. And the um, the thing I would say is we need to also provide more awareness about HBCUs. What is an HBCU? Like, how was I 37 years old before or 38 years old before I even, you know, realized that HBCUs were a thing? The same thing with HSIs, Hispanic Serving Institutions. Like, we just, you know, we see only the mainstream, you know, colleges, the, the you know, Texas, um, OU, my son goes to OU because that was something that I saw as a level of achievement, a level of um, success, right? Because my world was so, my, my, you know, my blinders were on, it was so limited. So we didn't even pursue or, or look into HSIs. I wasn't even aware of those, you know, until this year and really how they're um, structured and set up across, you know, the, the nation. But I just don't think we give our children enough from the very beginning enough, like, hey, HBCU, like that needs to be part of, of the vocabulary. It needs to be part of the conversation to, you know, kind of just have it awareness. Like, I just don't think we give enough attention to it. We don't give enough. Uh, well, don't feel bad about dialogue. it. Uh, no, no, no. I, don't, I, would, I would say don't feel bad about not knowing about it until, um, you know, you're in your 30s because that's intentional. They want to keep these tools from us uh, is part of the propaganda that that starts very early on in our education system uh, to keep these tools and access to power uh, from us. And so, um, you know, if they can isolate you, they can control you. And it's hard, really hard to isolate you when you're in a sea of people that look like you, who are intelligent, who are um, ambitious, who are trying to to win at all costs against all odds. Absolutely. Absolutely here. You know, uh, I, I love that that conversation, man. And uh, just diving deep into a little bit deeper into your Morehouse experience. Um, I'm aware that you pledged IOTA. Right. Um, can you share with the listeners what is uh, the group known as IOTA? Right. And uh, why did you make that selection to to go with them out out of the other, um, you know, fraternities that are out there? Right. Another happy accident, uh, another uh, form of a blessing uh, that I, I did not deserve, uh, but, uh, but I uh, am happy that I took advantage of. Um, it's IOTA Phi Theta Fraternity International, um, and it was started by non-traditional students. You know, they were a little bit older uh, when they were on, on, on campus. Um, and my freshman year, I toured around with uh, joining some of the more uh, known members of the National Panhandlotic Council. And this is not to throw shade at anyone in, in the in the panel, uh, because I think all of those organizations are doing great work. Uh, but uh, as I sort of got my feet wet in that situation, it, I did not feel as though it was a good fit for my personality and, and what I felt like their personality as a group was on campus. And so I sort of backed off on that. And then um, as I got into leadership in different ways, you know, I was an RA and um, got a chance to uh, have an impact on some of the younger students on campus and then moved off campus. One of my students that had been on um, my floor as an RA got involved in IOTA and I saw, you know, him flourish and what it was doing for him. Um, you know, shout out to the GOAT, um, Lamar. Uh, and I saw what it was doing for him, and he brought brought up to me, you know, about the idea of me joining joining in with them. And, and as I got to learn more about them and what they were about, it felt like home. Um, 
I'm very much uh, a proponent of one of one of our sayings, which is to uh, to build a tradition instead of resting upon one. And so that sort of spoke to where I was and at that point in my life and still. And so, you know, I'm always trying to um, have ownership and, and build something uh, for me that, you know, I can pass on uh, to my kids or at least pass on those skill sets uh, to my, my children so that they can do the same for themselves. I feel like my parents did that for me. And so where I was in, in my life at that point and still, um, I felt like I was an iota before I knew what iota was, just sort of like I felt like I needed to be at Morehouse before I knew what Morehouse could offer me. So um, it was just another happy accident. So uh, going to Morehouse, right, uh, pledging iota, how do you end up at Harding University? <laughs> um, thank god that you did but yeah yeah um that was the weirdest social experiment that i have ever <laughs> conducted on myself um and uh, kiki's laughing diane because as i said i was in atlanta in mecca for young black and brown uh bodies um, I, I highly recommend anyone who spent any time in Atlanta in the late nineties knows exactly what I'm talking about, but I feel like it's the same, uh, now at the AUC, but I, I went from the height of that blackness, um, to North central Arkansas and, um, the how of that is, um, in my summers in college, I was working as a, a camp counselor at, at a, at a camp that's affiliated with the, the church of Christ. Um, Harding University is affiliated with the Church of Christ, and and the director, his younger brother was a professor in the communications department at Harding University, and uh, they sort of cornered me um, at a at a party we were we were all at, and and said, hey, we know what you want to do this this and this in journalism, and you're thinking about moving on to TV after that. We got this little school down here in Searcy, Arkansas, that has its own TV station. And if you choose to go there, uh, you can write your own ticket. And um, again, wanting to control my own destiny, I was looking at it. I'll go get a job at a newspaper, work for 10 years and sort of flip that into a career in in, in TV, sports journalism at the time. I, you know, my career icon uh, mentor that I was looking up was like Michael Wilbon. And so um, I was trying to follow that path. But I saw this as a way that I could jumpstart it. It's like, well, if I can go learn TV now, I could shorten that 10 years to five or, or, or maybe so. I did it. True to their word, I was able to write my own ticket and, you know, literally sitting in the registrar's office or the director of, of the communications department's office and sort of planning my own educational um, curriculum. And then I would walk over to the bursars and, you know, literally they would input the class into their system. And so I was making up my program as I went. So they, they were true to their word. But when you go from the Mecca of all those black people to Searcy, Arkansas, where, I mean, as Key will tell you, um, you know, you could very easily know the names uh, of all the black people on campus. Um, it was it was different. Uh, it was different. It was very, very different. Um, it was a place where I had to be careful about where and how far off of campus I went because some places weren't safe for me being a, a black person. Um, it was a place where if I happened to be in a grocery store with a, uh, a young white lady, you know, platonic relationship, or whatever, um, cashiers would turn their noses up and, and as though I had uh, severely injured them. Um, so that was a very, very different experience. Uh, but I'm glad that I did the Morehouse part first because um, I had knowledge of self and also knowledge of my people. And so there was nothing that folks who did not have that information uh, could do to change how I felt about myself. Um, it, but it was more of a reflection of, of their character. So um, it was, it was a nice little social experiment to see how strong Morehouse made me. Wow. Well, well, yeah, man, well, you definitely navigated uh, that university like a champion uh, there. I remember, you know, yeah, several yeah. productions. I remember the rants. I remember that show uh, that you guys put together. I remember uh, just you being a, a great presence and a leader on the campus, like immediately, you know, um, I think people gravitated to you 
And of course, we were in a situation where, like you said, you know, uh, we could venture outside of the campus and some areas weren't safe. And it just wasn't from the people of the yeah. community. It was, you know, police, uh, like you said, you know, store clerks. Uh, we were in yep. White County, Arkansas, and it the name says it all there. So we'll just kind of leave it at that, man. But I always wondered uh, how you got uh, to H-U, but I'm glad you did, man, because you were a big influence on me. You're a big influence on a lot of our, my brothers, yep. of course, Capital Gamma Beta, people from there. Um, you know, so, man, I just appreciate, you know, our relationship and the fact that you made that decision to write your own ticket uh, here. With that being said, man, you know, I know you do a lot of work in the community and I know that you are right now um, involved with raising funds for um, in the medical arena. Um, I, I wanted you to kind of speak more to that um, RAM. What is RAM? What is that? What is your role? So I work for Remote Area Medical, which is a nonprofit or nonprofit organization that provides health care to, to those in need. Uh, we conduct pop up clinics that provide dental, vision and medical care uh, to people who couldn't otherwise uh, access it. Um, and those barriers to access are, are both financial and geographic. We do a lot of our clinics in rural areas and in communities that are um, marginalized. And so um, my particular role, I am the development manager at RAM. I'm in charge of all the fundraising function. And we're, our job, um, as assigned by the, our board of directors, is to raise the funds in order for us to be able to conduct our operating budget. Um, we do clinics in, uh, we have the ability to do clinics in all 48 uh, contiguous states. And um, we even have some international programs in, in Haiti and in uh, Guyana, which was uh, where the idea for RAM was started by our founder, Stan Brock, who is uh, um, unfortunately passed away, but he had been a um, movie and TV star. Uh, he was on The Wild Kingdom um, and, you know, kind of rose to fame on that show. Uh, but we we basically work on what we call a community host group model. And we'll go into communities that request our presence because we don't ever want to go anywhere where we're not asked to be. Uh, but we'll go into those communities uh, when a day's time or so set up uh, a, a pop-up clinic and then, you know, that weekend offer those services thanks to uh, our donors and our volunteer professionals and um, who provide those services. And you don't have to be a professional to in order to volunteer because, you know, there's all kinds of work that needs to be done to to set that clinic up. But yeah, well, um, each clinic takes about, you know, 12 to 18 months to plan. But, you know, we get into town, we set up quickly, um, provide those services, and then we move on to the next next city. But it's, it's just about... Um, I wanted me personally, I wanted to move from the arguments that I was having online about healthcare access. You know, I, I personally believe that all um, citizens should have access to healthcare. Um, but it's one thing for me to just argue about that online. It's another thing for me to try to use my talents in order to make that happen. And I just felt, at, you know, at a point I needed to move from the former to the latter. And so uh, when I was looking for a new place to live as my family was growing. Um, I expanded that search to other cities because I had been living in St. Petersburg, Florida at the time. And I found Ram in East Tennessee. And I was like, you know, this is a perfect marriage of, of my talents and, and my politics. And so I wanted to, to try to make that happen. But Ram itself is a very apolitical organization. Like, you know, we, um, we don't put it out there that this is what should happen or this is what the solution is. We just want to be a part of getting that care to people right now. You know, the government eventually is going to figure out some sort of solution for this problem. In the meantime, people need help. And we wanted to be a part of, of the folks that are helping. Man, first of all, I love that. So uh, you just helped me understand really what RAM is. So RAM is actually an international program, right? So I got two questions to follow up on that. Number one is how can if, if I lived in a in an area where I wanted to maybe request you guys services, what is the process? How would I get in contact with you guys? That's a great question. Um, that process starts through our website, which is ramusa.org. Um, and there's a link on there about bringing RAM to your community. Um, once you fill out that form, you'll be contacted by one of our clinic coordinators or our clinic manager who will sort of outline that process, that planning process, 
in order to bring that clinic to your town. And then you'll go through, uh, you know, that checklist of items that you need to do because there's things that the community host group needs to, to provide in order for us to be able to come out there. And so uh, you kind of work that plan. And, you know, we work hand in hand as partners to make that happen. And then hopefully, you know, a year later, 18 months later, there have been a couple of situations where there were a much shorter time frame to make that happen. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's lots of lessons learned. We started in 85. And so we've learned how to refine that process as we've gone along. Uh, but you you connect with us through our website, or if you uh, don't have access to the web, you can all, always call HQ, uh, which is uh, 865-579-1530. Um, I'm sure if you guys want to make that information available to your listeners, you, you, you can. But um, it starts from the very beginning. It's a partnership between RAM and the community. You, you link, link up with us, and we'll walk you through the process. One of the things you actually spoke about this earlier, killing your masters. You've been very vocal about killing our masters. I'm aware of what this is, but I'd like for you to explain to our listeners, what does that mean? And and maybe even why you uh, have adopted that uh, slogan as well. Well, music is a very powerful thing. And sometimes it gives voice to some of the thoughts that you've had in your head uh, before. Um, I'm a very, very big fan of, of Run the Jewels which is Killer Mike and LP. And um, on one of their albums, I believe it was Letter to the Shareholders, uh, they talked about killing your masters. And what that means to me is removing the barriers to freedom in your life. And um, a lot of times in America, those barriers to freedom are financial. Um, and and uh, it, it always comes back to the finances. And so one of the first steps for me for killing my masters was to remove debt. From my situation and and so uh, i tried to remove all the cyclical monthly debt that i could so i had that financial freedom to make some some decisions um, if you own your own business um, and you're controlling the ways that you uh, are able to provide for your family that gives you another level of freedom which is another master that you're, you're killing uh, but our system in general is has devolved into an oligarchy and ultimately the quote unquote masters are those uh, corporations and individuals that control economic access and um, resources. And so the more you can remove them from your life, the freer that you are. Uh, sometimes people think that I'm, you know, it sounds like I, cause I'm using the, the verb kill. It sounds like I'm, I'm, I'm meaning to be violent, but, it, but it's not. It's about changes that you can make in your own life and to make you more resilient against the powers that that don't necessarily have your interests in mind. Right. So it's more of a mentality. Right. So in order to be enslaved, they have to break you down mentally and you have to, like you said, be controlled in a mental way. So it's almost like killing that concept of what they've delivered to you as this is the path. This is the way you're saying, hey cut all that out we need to be focused on our own economic empowerment is is that a short way of saying that yeah but and it, but it's not just about money it's about being able to take care of your family so if you can do that without money all more power to you like so you know being able to feed yourself you know if you can grow your own food if if you can sew your own clothes or or you know things of that nature or remove that capitalistic desire for stuff Jeremy, thank you so much for being a guest on today's show. For our listeners, you can find Jeremy Ritt and Infinite Skills on their website at infiniteskillswithaz.com.